Hare Krishna. Nice to hear everyone's there. Okay. So we can begin? Yes? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Yes. Okay. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare So welcome everyone this evening to the uh, well it's afternoon there right <laughs> You're on a different time scale from me. So we'll... Oh, let's see. So can we begin here? Is everyone seeing this? Do you see the... Can you see yes, the... Yes, Maharaj. You can see the PowerPoint, yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Oh. Okay, good. Okay, so here's the questions from the last... Uh, from the last session on chapter 14. Just quickly look over them. Some characteristics of a person situated in the mode of goodness. What would you say? Someone? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, the uh, person will uh, get up early and maintain, uh, I mean, take bath uh, regularly early morning and have, uh, what is called, maintain cleanliness and uh, do a devotional service. What, what, put, what does Krishna particularly say? The nature of somebody in the mode of goodness. That they're conditioned to a certain mood, certain attitude. No sinful activities. Happiness. Happy. Happy. Happiness. Yes, happy. Happiness. They're very happy. Knowledge. Yeah. Tolerance. Uh, they're happy. Why are they happy? Maharaj, they are very knowledgeable, so because they are satisfied, Maharaj, yes. because they are less affected by material miseries. Yes, but what? what Maharaj, do... mm -hmm. they are satisfied. They are satisfied. Yeah. What? In the the, generally, they're thinking they're better than others. They're happy because they're thinking they're better off than other people. Because of their knowledge. Yeah, well, they're they're, they have knowledge and they're thinking that they're, they're superior, they're better, in a better condition of life, better situation. So they're happy. So this is the nature of somebody in the mode of goodness. That, and they get, often get stuck there. The, generally, this happiness and the sense of knowledge, they're the main characteristics of people in the mode of goodness. And what, what is the result of action in the mode of passion? <laughs> the living entity is bound to material social actions. And they become very greedy, Maharaj. Well, and they are greedy and passionate to 
Uh, what? Uh, uh, fruity actions. What's the result? Misery. That's the answer. That's what I'm looking for. Misery. The result of action in the mode of passion is always misery. They don't get a happiness from it. It's just misery. All right. So yes, sir. Lyrics and patience, uh, and I'm going to bring it up the screen. Can everybody see this? Can everyone see this? What's happening? You all can see the screen. Yes, we can see the screen. No, no, who is, who is talking? Is, Maharaj is not talking. Who is talking then? Yeah, Saitosh Prabhu, can you please control this? I think there is a cross connection somehow. somehow. So, I think, then I think we should rejoin then, Prabhuji. Night has gone. It looks like it has gone. No, Prabhu, someone else had their microphone on and they had class with uh, Swarup Damodar Prabhu going on. So, we got confused. Uh -huh. So, now it's okay. Looks like okay. Okay. Yeah, Maharaj, sorry, sorry for this challenge. Okay, we'll continue. So the result of action in the mode of passion is misery, specifically stated there in the Bhagavad Gita by Lord Krishna. Re results in misery. And how do we transcend the modes of nature? By unalloyed devotion service, Maharaj. Yes, thank you very much, right? Okay, very good. We'll go ahead. Right? So we, we spoke about these things, the entanglement. In the last class we spoke how we're in the modes of nature and we're entangled. And then we spoke about ways in which we are personally maybe influenced by passion and ignorance. It's not easy working and a lot of stress these days. So it gives up, we're often influenced by the passion and ignorance. And how can we cultivate the mode of goodness? We spoke about that. And there's a number of statements about Prabhupada's purport in that 14th chapter, which reflect his mission. His mission was to educate people about these modes of nature, to help them to understand their situation and to show them how they can get free from the modes of nature. Hmm? So it's very important to understand. Okay. So we'll go ahead here. Association with the material nature entangles him. I'm ju I'll just read this quote to you. In his constitutional position, the living entity is above the three modes of material nature. But association with material nature entangles him in the different modes of material nature, goodness, passion and ignorance. Due to the association of these three modes, his desire to dominate the material world is there. By engagement in devotional service, in full Krishna consciousness, he is immediately situated in the transcendental position. And his unlawful desire to control material nature is removed. So this is the potency of devotional service, that it takes away that desire to control the material nature. It situates us in the mood of being the servant of Krishna. Right? So very powerful. We'll go ahead to this lesson, chapter 15. It's called The Banyan Tree and Purushottam Yoga. Of course, in the, in the English text they call it the Yoga of the Supreme Person, which is a translation of the Yoga Purushottam. And they've also, we've also added the Banyan Tree, because Krishna gives this example of the Banyan Tree in the beginning of the chapter. Could com to compare the position of the material world to the spiritual world. 
So the first five slokas deal with this example of the banyan tree and we'll hear how the material world resembles a banyan tree. And then the chapter goes on to speak about transmigration, how we move into different bodies. Then we'll hear how Krishna is the maintainer, how he's maintaining us materially and also directing us spiritually. And then the last section of the chapter, the summary of the Vedanta Sutra. Right? It's a short chapter, only 20 verses, but very important, significant chapter. It's good to know. Okay, so we're going to look at this banyan tree, the entanglement of this material world is compared here to a banyan tree, right? Do you all know the banyan tree or the ashwata tree as they're called sometimes, Sanskrit? Yes, you, yes. You're familiar with these kind of trees? Yeah, yeah. Do you know anything specific, what's significant about the banyan tree? Well, uh, of course. Hmm? Uh, regarding... Branches are down, Maharaj. Right. Yeah. Very strong roots. Yeah. The Maharaj roots are upwards. The branches go down and the roots up, right? There's a very big banyan tree in the Calcutta Botanical Gardens. If you ever get a chance to go to Calcutta Botanical Gardens, you'll see it there. It's very, very huge. And it must have been growing for hundreds of years. You know, generally these trees, the banyan tree, once they start growing, they, they, they grow for a long time. So they're very special trees. You know, we, we respect them. Just like we respect Tosi, we respect also the banyan tree. So the, the banyan tree has these specific characteristics that, as Maharaji said, the branches go down and the roots are up. Here you can see where the, the, there's two trees here. One is the actual tree and the other is the reflection. You can see in this, in this diagram on the screen, you can see there's like a blue lake there, that's the water, like a lake, and the trees growing on the side of the lake, and you can see the reflection. So this tree is reflected on the water, and the same way the tree of the material world is reflected on desire, our desire entangles us in this tree. So we're identifying some of the significant points of this tree. Urva mulam, the roots are up. The root is up because it's coming from the spiritual world. The, the real tree is actually in the spiritual world. And this tree here in the material world this is just the reflection of the real tree, not actually the real tree. Material world is just the reflection of the real tree. So because the roots are up, it's coming from Brahma, from the higher planet, from uh, initially from the spiritual world. Lord Brahma is the first living entity and co it's coming down from there. So the roots are up and here you can see Adasaka, right? Adasaka meaning the branches, downward branches, upward root and the branches are down. So reflection. Then you have leaves. Nice tree, oh, and the leaves on this tree, the leaves on this tree represent the Vedic hymns. Within the Vedas, they sing beautiful hymns. So the tree, the beauty of the tree, the leaves, 
In the same way, the, the material world, we enjoy the beauty of the Vedas, nice hymns, glorifying life, praising the situation. So Vedic hymns are the leaves, and then the tips of the branches are like the senses. The birds come, they like to eat the tips of the branches. And so the senses are compared to the tips of the branches, and the twigs are compared to the sense objects. The senses means the knowledge acquiring senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the skin. And the sense objects means taste, smell, sight, touch, like that sound, these things, sense objects. Then you have fruit. A good tree will have some fruit. So what are the fruits of this banyan tree? They're compared to the fruit of the material world. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. These things. So the banyan tree is very big. Grows everywhere. We can read from the Bhagavad Gita. Read how Krishna describes in the first verse he said, It is said there is an imperishable banyan tree that has its roots upwards, its branches down, and whose leaves are the Vedic hymn. One who knows this tree is the knower of the Vedas. Right? We want to know this tree. Just like we want to know the Vedas, we, sh we can know this tree the Vedas from this tree. This tree explains the situation of the material world. Verse number two continues, the branches of this tree extend downward and upward, nourished by the three modes of material nature. That's also important to remember, that the branches are nourished by the three modes. The twigs are the objects of the senses. The tree has its roots going down. And these are bound. These are bound to the fruit of action of human society. Verse number three and four goes on, continues to describe more about the tree. The real form of this tree cannot be perceived. Cannot be perceived. Hare Krishna, uh, can we please uh, ask everyone to mute their mics? Oh. Except Maharaj. Yes, please, everybody, mute your mic, please. Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. In text 3 and 4, Lord Krishna describes, No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, or where its foundation is. Just like if you go, if we're in this banyan tree, it's very vast. And because the branches have grown into the ground, so you don't know which one is the trunk. You don't know where is the real root of the tree. So, very difficult to know where it begins or where it ends. So, how to get free from this tree? Because we're in the material world. This is. Father, the... how do I take picture here? How do you take picture? Hare Krishna. Sorry, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Everybody, please mute your mic. You're disturbing the whole class, sorry. Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj, sorry for the disturbance. Oh, okay. Uh, so we're in this illusory tree, the, the, the mirage, the reflection of the tree. How are we going to get out? We can't, we can't find the root. We have to cut our way out, right? So we've, we've shown here, we've stated from the verse there, at the end of the third verse, it says, Asanga Shastrena Didrena Chitva. Right? 
Asangashastrena. Asangashast. You have to. The shastrena means the weapon. We need an. We need an axe. We need some sharp knife or an axe is better because it's a very strong tree, very thick branches, heavily rooted in the ground. You have to have a very strong weapon. So asanga shastrena. Asanga means detachment, with the weapon of detachment, dhidrena, dhidrena chitva, we can cut our way out from that tree. So this, this is the different points, the different features of this tree. Cut down this strongly rooted tree with the weapon of detachment. Hmm? Srila Prabhupada gives some interesting points in relation to this uh, downward branches and upward root. He said, just like if you have to keep yourself legs up and the head down, somebody keeps you like this, how long will you feel comfortable? If somebody takes your legs, catches you, your head down, that is not very comfortable. So this whole material world is like that. Urva mulam. Mulam should have been down, but it is up. Therefore, it is uncomfortable. And then Prabhupada gives another explanation. He said, just like perverted reflection. We have got experience of the Urva Mulam. On the bank of a river or the bank of a pond, the tree is standing. But we see the reflection. We find that the same tree in the reflection has become Urva Mulam and Adasakam. So by this statement, Krishna says that this is not real. That reflection in the water of the tree is not real. Real tree is up. Similarly, real enjoyment, real varieties, everything is in the, the spiritual world. It is simply reflection. Here in this material world, it is not factual. Therefore, our enjoyment here is called maya or illusion. So Krishna is comparing this entanglement which we are in, in the material world, uh, to the tree, the tree of material nature. I want to go back just to show you this uh, because uh, we have to understand, like in a tree, there will be branches. Some will be branches on the lower part of the tree, and some will be higher up in the tree. And there are different species of life, different living entities are situated in different positions in the tree. In the bottom of the tree, in the dark region of the tree, that's the lower species of life, the animal species, insects, these kind of creatures. And on the topper, upper part of the tree, you have the, the demigods living up there in the top part of the tree. But you can see how it's compared to the universe in different ways, the, the different situation on the planet, the different living entities in different positions. And they're all like living entities situated in different positions in this tree. So how to get out of the tree, right? We said asanga shastrena. So Prabhupada says to get out of the entanglement of this strong banyan tree of material life, one must surrender to Krishna. As soon as one surrenders unto Krishna, one becomes detached automatically from this material extension. Hmm? So this is very nicely described 
Here's the verse. Hmm? Text number five from the Bhagavad Gita. How we can surrender to Krishna. What do we need to do to cultivate this detachment or this surrender? So it's. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, there's a question. Uh -huh. uh, the upper part of the tree, that means the roots or the leaves. Uh, uh, where the, this, uh, the this, uh, uh, lower animals uh, are uh, situated. Upper part of the tree means the branches and the top part of the tree. Yeah, upper man means the branches. So the animals are situated on the branches. Yes, right. It's all situated okay, on you, the Mother. branches, right. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. uh, so how to get cut down this tree, how to get out from this tree, this text number five is describing the surrendering process by which we cultivate our detachment, right? Because asanga shastrena, asanga, that's the, the detachment and the shastrena is the weapon. So the weapon of detachment, detachment comes about naturally as we surrender to Krishna. When we surrender to Krishna, then we become detached from the material and we become attached to Krishna because we've taken shelter of Krishna. So we lose our attraction for the material world. So this verse nicely describes why we're in this material world and what we need to do to get free from our entanglement in this material world. We'll read the translation. Those who are free from false prestige, illusion and false association, who understand the eternal, who are done with material lust, who are freed from the dualities of happiness and distress and who unbewildered know how to surrender unto the Supreme Person, attain to that eternal kingdom. So Lord Krishna in these first five verses has described this banyan tree, right? Just like we talk about, we were learning from chapter 14, the modes of nature, the mode of goodness is this upper, like the upper part of the tree. And passion and ignorance is like the lower regions of the tree. So we're in this material world and we have the problem that, right, you can see Asanga, uh, nirmana moha, jita sanga dosha. Dosha, what's our fault? This nirmana moha, right? We have this problem that <laughs> we're attached, we're in illusion, we're thinking, you know, we're very good, we're very nice, we're very great. And we have to get free from that. This illusion, the false association. So it's not so easy because we're conditioned souls. But if we take shelter of Krishna, then Krishna gets rid of all these faults. The faults, the bad things which we have, that pride, that illusion, it's all taken away by Krishna, just by surrendering unto Krishna, by engaging in his service. So, Krishna said, if we surrender unto him, we attain to the eternal kingdom. So we, naturally we will want to know, well, what's it going to be like there in that eternal kingdom? So Krishna then goes on, text number six, he's describing about that, that abode. 
text number six says, that supreme abode of mine is not illumined by the sun or moon, nor by fire or electricity. Those who reach it never return to this material world. Mm. Right? So, Lord Krishna is describing there something about the spiritual world. There's no need of the sun or moon. We need the sun to keep us warm, to provide heat, to, so we can, when we do laundry, we can dry the clothes with the help of the sun. And from the moon, the moon puts the juice, the, the, it, it gives a taste to the vegetables. Moon is also cooling in the evening. But Krishna said, in his abode, in the supreme abode, there's no sun or moon. And there's, there's no fire or electricity. Oh, we may wonder, what? No fire? No electricity? Oh, how will we cook? How will we keep warm? <laughs> no, everything is arranged by the mercy of Krishna. We don't need these things. You don't need to pay the electricity bill. <laughs> it's often coming, it's often the problem, the electricity bill. But we're free with all that, you see? This is a verse. So we never need to come back to this world. So that's, that's very nice. It should attract that, particularly if you have to live in a very cold place. You know, some parts of the world are very cold. They have a very short summer, maybe only two months, when the temperature comes above freezing. And the rest of the year, minus 20, minus 30, minus 40. One of the devotees recently told, he just went back to his home in Canada. He said it's been minus 40 for several days there in Canada during the winter. So we cannot imagine so cold. So how much you must have to spend on electricity to keep warm. So Krishna says, don't worry, if you come to my abode, you don't have that problem. You don't need electricity. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, what is this foolishness? Why should you pay the electric bill? Go there and live there. No need. Natadbasayate. The spiritual world is not lit by the sun or moon. Because everyone is effulgent, every planet is effulgent. So therefore, there's no need of these things. There is no ignorance, no scarcity, no miserable condition. Hmm. We should be attracted. We should be captivated, Prabhupada writes in the purport. We should be captivated by this information. He should desire to transfer himself to that eternal world, extricate himself from this false reflection of reality. Just like in material world we hear about, you know, you hear about Los Angeles or Hawaii or something, and you think, oh, I think I'd like to go there. So in the same way, we should hear about Goloka. We should hear about Vaikuntha and we should be attracted. You should be thinking, oh, I want to go there, I want to go there. Very, very nice way, cultivate this mood that we want to go there to be with Krishna. Okay, going ahead a little bit. Okay, text number seven, the next verse after Describing about the spiritual world, we read number seven, a very nice verse. Probably one of your memorization verses, is it? Maybe? 
Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Buddha Sanatana, Manashastani Indriyani, Prakriti Stani Karshati. Okay, Pristi, uh, Krishna is saying, due to conditioned life, we're struggling with the six senses, including the mind. Karshati means a struggle, struggling hard. Manashastani, right? The, with the indriyani, with the mind and senses, we're struggling. Why are we struggling? Do you remember? Why are we struggling? What's the cause of the struggle? Somebody like to open it? Yes? We desire to have this enjoyment. We desire separate to enjoy from Krishna. Yes, right. Do you know a verse in the Bhagavad Gita where we Krishna describes how we are desiring like that? Uh, is it Dhyayato Vishyan Punsaha? Uh, no, it wasn't the one I was thinking of. But there is one verse. It comes in the beginning of the seventh chapter, text number five of the seventh chapter. Krishna is talking about. Yeah, right, yes, yes. And then Krishna, Jiva Bhuta Mahabaho, Yeidam Daryate Jagat. Right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to exploit the material nature. We are exploiting this material nature for our own enjoyment. So this is why prakriti stani karshati. This is why we're struggling, because we are trying to exploit the resources of the material world. Yeah? So we, we have a little exercise for you. We want you to... Just look through this verse, 15.7. Let's just work on the one verse, 15.7, first of all. And think of some significant philosophical points which we can use for preaching Krishna consciousness. Can you just take a minute or two to look through the purport and think how you might use this verse in preaching?
someone like to offer some contribution, some ideas, how we might use this verse in preaching? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, Maharaj, uh, Krishna is saying in this verse that uh, all are uh, part, part and parcel of uh, Krishna, or living entity. So we, we, this is a temporary place. Our, our original nature is eternal uh, and part and parcel, parcel of Krishna. But this all is temporary. So this is not the place where we should be living. So uh, to get to get from here to our uh, original place, we have to uh, follow the Krishna conscious process and uh, 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 and chanting process. Uh, and through satsanga, we can uh, um, go back to our original uh, home. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Yes, we we are conditioned souls, and we are here in this material world. It's not our real home. It's a temporary place. But we are parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. We have an eternal relationship with Him. And He wants us to come back to be with Him. So, Krishna Consciousness is a process by which we can re-establish re that relationship with Krishna. Someone else? Maharaj, in the purport, uh, Srila Prabhupada has explained that um, as long as we are here in this material life, um, we are dominated by the material modes of nature. And so it is like such a struggle to maintain our existence in the material world. So. As long as we're here, we're going to struggle no matter what. But later he explains that once we are liberated from this material world, only then that this condition, like the covering of the soul is uh, perished. So until we're here in this material world, we're always going to um, be facing difficulties. And so we should just really push faster to leave. Okay. Yes material body, this material world is not a very comfortable place. As Prabhupada was saying, if, if, we hold, if somebody takes our legs and holds up our legs with the head down, we're not very comfortable for long. And so we're in this material world, we're trying to enjoy this illusory place. But it's, it's so, many, so many troubles, so many difficulties come. So, we need to... Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare There's one more point here, quite interesting. Like, uh, the, we are all the fragmental parts and parcel of the Supreme Lord. So, yes. part of that, we also get a portion of His qualities, which is, uh, independence is one. Right. And Prabhupada very clearly says, by misuse of that independence, we become conditioned. And by proper use of that independence, we become liberated. Okay, very good. Yes, very nice point from the purport there. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, as a thread from the same fragmentary parts all the way towards the end, it's a very beautiful point to show that in the second chapter, although Krishna mentioned that uh, the soul cannot be cut into pieces, it does not mean that it is a material fragmentation. Our, our thing, we are sanatana. We are still, it is spiritually only we are fragmental, but not materially as we are trying to understand. Okay. So, he, uh, Prabhupada is trying to uh, bring out that point that it is not the fragmented part, does not mean that the soul is cut into pieces, but we are sanatana. Uh, okay, so we have, we have this, yeah. we have some eternal connection with the Supreme Lord. And it's not a case that, uh, it's not that we've been disconnected or been cut off from the Lord, but we ourselves misused our independence to come into this world. And we can re-establish our connection with Krishna through Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, just continuing on that point in the last paragraph, there is uh, Prabhupada stating, Devino Asman Yatha Dehi. 
also sometimes when we are preaching we uh, come across people who've had some um, like miss happening in their family or somebody has left his body then this portion can be used to preach to them that you know what like like what we see externally is just the material body and the soul never dies so it's just changing body like dehino asmin yatha dehe so when somebody is leaving his body uh, so we can give them a more philosophical point of view from here that he is actually um, probably going to a better place or there is no uh, real death as such because the soul is eternal it's sanatan okay yes very good yeah that's a very important point because we often have to preach in these situations somebody you know all the time people are leaving the body and people have to understand what is happening what is death and this just as we also have to understand what is birth so we should also understand what is death it's a change of body birth means we get a new body and death means you leave behind the old body so the body is just a vehicle for the soul but it's the soul which is part and parcel of lord krishna and we are all uh fragmental parts of krishna eternally so krishna consciousness has to be revived we have to learn how to do that yeah so hari krishna maharaj can i ask a question please um what ji uh, i am not very clear on this uh, word part of krishna fine part and parcel what exactly this parcel conveys part and parcel of krishna so what exactly this parcel word implies okay so part I mean you know we are tiny just like the spark coming from the fire so we're not equal to krishna we're a tiny part of krishna right but the parcel yes, parcel means the qualities are the same were different okay. in different in quantity but the same in quality all right we have the qualities of krishna but not in the same quantity so we say part and parcel all right it's the same parcel the same from the same parcel but different quantity just a tiny we're just a tiny part krishna is the real whole this purnam he's complete where the tiny part part that like the spark comes from the fire so the spark also has heat and light but it's not like the fire and different the quality is similar but the quantity is different so our relationship with krishna is like that we have the qualities of krishna but in a different quantity so we say part and partial is that clear thank you maharaj yeah yeah thank you maharaj mm -hmm. okay so let's look at go uh, let's look at the, uh, the the next few verses describe more about the the living entity how he takes another body takes number 8 up to 12 describing how the living entity is changing the body the living entity in the material world text number 8 carries his different conceptions of life from one body to another and krishna gives an example he said just as the air carries aromas right we have the example the air passes over a rose garden it will carry the fragrance of the roses but the same air passes over some lump a, a pile of garbage somewhere it will carry some other odor so the same way we carry different conceptions with us when we go from one body to another we take another body and then number 9 describes how we get a particular gross body with different senses special type certain type of ear eye tongue nose sense of touch all grouped about the mind and thus he enjoys a particular set of sense objects 
So this is the changing body. Lord Krishna goes on to describe text number 10. The foolish can... Maharaj, yes? Hare Krishna, Maharaj, sorry to interrupt uh, uh, this uh, part. Um, in the purport of the ninth uh, verse, it says that con if uh, similarly consciousness is pure, or the spirit soul is pure, so but consciousness is changed according to the association of the material qualities. So, Maharaj, I would like to know what is this consciousness and the spirit soul? I thought the soul itself is the consciousness because... Um, not very. Maybe we need to understand it better, Maharaj. Uh -huh. It's in the ninth. Uh, uh -huh. uh, the consciousness is originally pure, like water. But if you mix water with a certain color, it changes. Mm -hmm. Similarly, consciousness is pure, or the spirit soul is pure. Mm -hmm. But consciousness is changed according to the association of the. So, is there a difference between the consciousness and the spirit soul, Maharaj? Um, I need a bit more uh, more light on this. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. They're different. Thank you, Con consciousness is like the symptom of the soul. We give the example just like sunlight is like the symptom of the sun. So, consciousness is the symptom of the soul. Just like the light, when we see the light of the sun, we can understand there's a sun, and the sun is in the sky, the sun planet is there. We just see the sunlight. We don't actually see the sun planet, but we see the sunlight. In the same way, consciousness is the symptom of the soul. So that consciousness can be covered over, it can be polluted, like that. We take different... Uh, Conceptions, you know, we have material consciousness, like that. It's just like the verse described, the consciousness, consciousness is not pure. It becomes adulterated by some type of material mentality. So in the next life you get a corresponding body. The real consciousness is Krishna consciousness. If our consciousness is Krishna consciousness, then we'll get a body of a devotee. We'll, we'll take, a next life will be a devotee. Maybe even go back to Godhead and be with Krishna. But the consciousness can be polluted by different states of mind. Just like the sunlight can be, if you pass the light through colored paper, then the light is originally, you know, clear, white, but you pass it through some colored paper or some, and it will become red. The light will become red or the light will become blue, you know, just by passing the light through some other kind of filter, uh, some paper, colored paper. The consciousness can be tinted. The color, the light can be tinted. So in the same way our consciousness is also tinted due to different desires, different conceptions. Thinking, I'm a man or I'm a woman, I'm black or I'm white, right? The, these different bodily conceptions of life. Is it clear now, Maharaji? Thank you, Maharaj. So the consciousness is something that the soul carries with it. Also, Maharaj, like Vayu Gandha Nivashaya, like it carries a fragrance, the air carries. Yes, like that. By yes. like changing the body. But yes, consciousness is, and we gave the example, the light and the sun. Just like the light and the sun cannot be separated. Cannot be separated. There's, no mean, you, there's no meaning to light without sun, to, to the light without the sun. There's no meaning to sun without light, right? It, the same way consciousness and the soul, they cannot be separated. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, in the same context, if one body to another body, by the soul, suppose the soul is in the uh, tree body, the consciousness will be different. When it goes to the human body, or animal body, the consciousness will be different because the does the consciousness also uh, uh, matters for the knowledge or uh, intelligence? 
the consciousness will uh, well the, the soul carries the, the soul uh, when it passes body to body uh-huh. but when it passes the consciousness of the tree is not same as the consciousness of the animal or the consciousness of the animal is not same as the consciousness of the human being does the Well, the intelligence of the, the the consciousness can be the same, but the difference is the body is different, because it, because the soul is in a particular body, so the consciousness is greatly restricted, just like the soul is in the tree, so the consciousness cannot be exhibited in the same manner as the consciousness in the human body, because the tree body. Is you know the the tree is stuck in the ground, cannot move, cannot speak, cannot express itself so easily like the human being. But the consciousness can be the same, but it's just that it, because of the body, therefore the it cannot manifest the it cannot express the consciousness. Just like the soul goes into the dog. Now the dog's body, the soul's in the dog. The dog, what can he do? He can only bark. But the soul, which is in that dog's body, it has desires. You know, it has wants to do things. It wants to eat. He wants to to mate with other dogs. And you know, but the the consciousness is there. Is just expressed through the body in a different way. So it's the body which res restricts the consciousness, but the consciousness is the same. It's the same. The soul is the same. The soul in the tree, the soul in the dog, the soul in the human being, or in the demigod, the souls are all the same. So the consciousness is the same. The original pure consciousness is Krishna consciousness, but due to different bodies, our consciousness may be restricted. It may be. It won't be able to manifest itself. Do you agree? Yeah, thank you, understood, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. So, sorry, interrupt again. Uh, Maharaj, is it not that the soul is changing from one body to change in the consciousness of that uh, that that soul? Because let's say is there in the higher higher uh, higher species like human, the next birth it goes to a, a tree body. So is it not because of the change of the consciousness of the soul? That's why because of some uh, factors in you know, karma or something, because of the change, that's why it's going to a tree body, is that it? Yeah. yeah well, we could say like that that the conscious that it has that consciousness. You, you, you know, how does the tree, what would be the mentality to enter into the tree body? Maybe somebody desires to be very big, very tall, stand over others. But usually tree body is given, it's like a punishment to the soul. Souls are sinful, some sinful souls are put into the bodies of tree to restrict them. Just like in our Damodar Lila, you know, in the Damodar Lila we have the two demigods, Narada Muni cursed them to become trees and they had to stand as trees. It was a punishment because of their foolishness, because of their bad behavior. They were put into the tree body. But they kept the consciousness while they were in that tree body. But usually, ordinary souls who are put into tree body, they won't remember. In the case of, in the Damodar Lila, those two souls, they remembered their previous life. But generally, the other souls which enter in tree body, they forget their past activity and they're put into the tree body. And the, their consciousness is greatly just restricted. It's like, you know, having your feet planted in the ground and you cannot move and you just stand there. And so, the, you know, the, the means of express expression is restricted. You're not able to express yourself when you're put into that kind of body.
Is it all right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Maharaj, one more question I have. In uh, uh, nine, uh, uh, in the 14th chapter, it is said that uh, in t uh, 24 components of the field of activity, in that sloga, it is said, consciousness is the manifestation of subtle body. That is, subtle body is mind, intelligence, and ego. So, uh, if one gets eternal liberation, this consciousness will not be with uh, the soul? Uh, this consciousness will be with the pure consciousness. It will be pure consciousness with the soul. It will be Krishna consciousness. Because if we get liberation, oh. we have to purify the mind, the intelligence, and the, all these things. Right? So it will be Krishna consciousness. Consciousness. Okay, Maharaj. Otherwise, in material world, it is a condition, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Material life, we're conditioned souls. But we can also become Krishna conscious in this world. It's not that we have to wait to get out of this world but before we become Krishna conscious. We can become conscious now. But when we use the body and the mind and the words all for Krishna's service, then that is liberation. That is pure consciousness. Right? We have to come to uh, that. We have to come to that stage. Okay, thank so, you, Maharaj. So take oh, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Okay, one last question. Yeah, uh, yeah last question. As the consciousness is restricted by the body, mm -hmm. uh, means uh, the consciousness of the human being and the consciousness of the tree may not be the same because it is restricted by the body in which he is entangled. Now, what about the intelligence? Does the intelligence also restrict it similarly by the body? Oh, yes. I mean, you can just see, you know, what's going to be the nature of the intelligence in the tree. The, in, the tree's simply thinking, where is light? Where, because the tree needs light to grow, right? And the tree also wants to get water, so the, the roots, the roots grow, it spreads the roots to support itself as it grows. And so that's all the intelligence, it manifests its intelligence to maintain its existence. Just like in material life, we use our intelligence for eating and sleeping and mating and defending. So the tree will also use his intelligence to make his to make the tree to, to allow the tree to stand strong, to grow well. So like that. Just use the intelligence in a different way, but for the maintenance, for the development of the body. Just like, you know, human body, we're using our intelligence, we, we think how to make money, how to, so that we can eat and sleep nicely, we can maintain our life properly. So the tree uses his intelligence so that the tree can stand nicely and the tree can grow well and produce nice fruits and branches, give good shade. Trees can also be very pious. Krishna glorified the trees for being very pious because they do so much for others. They provide fruit, they provide flowers, they give shelter. So sometimes it, some trees are very, very pious. Their souls in the tree are very special, pious. Particularly in the holy dham, the trees in the holy dham are very pure souls. Okay, text, okay, text number 10, Lord Krishna is saying, uh, The foolish cannot understand how we leave the body, nor can they understand what sort of body we enjoy under the spell of the modes of nature. But one whose eyes are trained in knowledge can see all this. So, this is important. People have to be trained. They have to develop the, the spiritual vision to understand what is happening. Hmm. Okay, going ahead, text number 11. The, in, the endeavouring transcendentalists who are situated in self-realisation can see all this clearly, but 
those whose minds are not developed and who are not situated in self-realization cannot see what is taking place, though they may try to. So you can see the difference. Krishna is con contrasting the two people, those who can see and those who can't. So those who have developed spiritual vision, they can understand these things. Text number 12 goes on. Krishna is going to describe, beginning text number 12, how he is maintaining this whole universe. He says, the splendor of the sun dissipates the darkness of the whole world, comes from me. The splendor of the moon, splendor of fire, also from me. So this is Krishna contributing to the maintenance of this world. Without his help, we'd be in great difficulty. Just imagine if the, everything is dark, if there's no sun, no moon, and the moon, very important. And then Krishna says, text 13, I enter into every, each planet. By my energy, they stay in orbit. Just like we, we look at the planets and we see how uh, very nicely, systematically, the planets are rotating. Who's arranging for all this? People don't see the creation. The, the, the unintelligent people, they cannot see how the Lord has created. So much design is there in the, in the world. But people are not seeing it. They take it all for granted. They say, oh, it's just by chance. Oh, it just happened like that. They don't like to give credit to Krishna. But without the grace of Krishna, the planets would not stay in orbit. Prabhupada explains, this, just like if you take some dust in our hand, and if you take some dust, you throw it, it will all fall to the ground. But here in the universe, so many planets are floating in space. How is it these planets are able to maintain their position in space? It is only due to the grace of Krishna, that Krishna is holding them by his mystic potency. He's able to maintain them in space. And then Krishna, he says also, I become the moon and supply the juice of life to all vegetables. The vegetables need to get moonlight to provide nice taste. When the vegetables grow, without the moonlight, they don't have any taste. You will see a lot of vegetables today, they grow them in tents, they grow them in an artificial atmosphere with no real sun or moonlight, so they don't have taste as they should do. Text 14, Krishna says, I am the fire of digestion in the bodies of all living entities. Without Krishna's grace, we cannot digest. And I join with the air of life, outgoing and incoming, to digest the four kinds of foodstuffs. So, the, the, this uh, power of digestion, which is very necessary, this fire in the belly, if there's no fire, then you cannot enjoy eating. And that's a problem <laughs> if you've no digest. Prabhupada used to take a chili. Before he would take his meal, he would have a chili because the chili would help to increase the fire of digestion. And Chanakya also said, he said, uh, if you drink water after a meal, it puts out the fire of digestion. So he, he, you should never drink water after a meal. You have to wait some time after a meal because if you immediately drink water after a meal, it puts out the fire of digestion. So that fire of digestion, that is Krishna, very necessary for our health. And then text 15, a very important verse, very well-known verse. Krishna is saying, he's in the hearts of all living entities and from him comes knowledge, remembrance and forgetfulness. So. Krishna's doing certain things to help us there. And then he says also, I am the author of the Vedas, I am the compiler of the Vedas, by all the Vedas I am to be known. So we'll give you a few minutes 
to just look over this verse and see what points you can come up with from 1515, which we could use in preaching. Is that all right, everyone? Just take two minutes, just quickly think how you could use this verse in preaching. It's my verse. If anyone has any point, you can immediately offer. Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. Whatever knowledge uh, we have, uh, and we may be proud of it, we need to uh, realize and remember that it's a gift from Krishna. Okay. What kind of knowledge? So, what kind of knowledge are you thinking of? Any kind of knowledge, be it material or uh, or spiritual in nature. So one needs need not be puffed up because of the knowledge one has acquired. Okay. The, the spirit spiritual knowledge is coming from Krishna, right? You can see in this verse, Krishna says, "Yes." He, 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 the Vedic knowledge. He said, "I am the author. I am the compiler of the Vedas, and by all the Vedas, I am to be known." So Krishna has given us this. Uh, this is his contribution to our spiritual life, that he has given us the Vedas to help us. And Bhagavad Gita also, this knowledge of Bhagavad Gita is also from Krishna. So that's his contribution to our spiritual position. And, yes, and materially, material now, you see, we're not so much worried so much about information knowledge, but the actual knowledge to understand more about the nature of life and who I am and why we're here, you know, the real questions of life. Why I'm suffering? We want to be happy. Why am I not happy? That's an important question. And so Krishna, answer, yes, Krishna answers these kind of questions. Yes, someone else has something? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj, in the point of preaching, you know, the, here in this purport it is clearly mentioned like whenever we, you know, we stopped our uh, service in our past life, we will continue from this life. So looking at our, you know, considering me as, you know, uh, in a family of, you know, uh, the Shudra family, all my brother, you know, uh, siblings are a different uh, mode of, uh, and I came into it. A Krishna conscious because of maybe because of I must have you know dropped there in previous life or some sukruti. I can I'm continuing here in this life. Well, generally we 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 say we have come to Krishna consciousness not just simply due to some by not just by our previous life but by the mercy of a devotee that some devotee somehow met you and influenced you and brought you to Krishna Consciousness. And generally we understand our birth in Krishna Consciousness is due to the mercy of a devotee. <laughs> right? Yes, not, true. Not, yes, true, my friend. Not just simply our own piety, because we, we get our piety by co contacting the devotees. It, Prabhupada creates our piety for us. Krishna says, from me comes knowledge. So we're born in this world. When we're born, we don't know anything. All the knowledge is gone from us. We, for, we forget everything. We don't remember our past life. Right? But 
Krishna is there as the super soul and he reminds us, he tells us what was our desire, what did we have from the past life, what was it we wanted, what was our consciousness at the end of the last life. We take that with us into the next life. And Krishna, as the super soul, he reminds us what was our desire, what did we want. And that's how we enter into that next body. The knowledge comes from Krishna. But sometimes we, we want to forget also. We, we, we like to forget sometimes, you know, our previous life or even this life. We like to forget some of the things which we did. Maybe we did things which were not very good, not proper. We like to forget them. But Krishna reminds us of them. He gives us the memory. So one devotee asked Prabhupada about this. He said, you know, sometimes when I'm chanting, sometimes the thought comes into my mind about what I was doing before I became a devotee, how I was engaged in sinful life. So he said, why is it it's like that? He said, when I'm chanting, why do these thoughts come in? So Srila Prabhupada explained, he said, yes, Krishna wants you to understand that if you ever go back to that life, then how bad it will be. So Krishna, want, he's reminding you to let you know how fortunate you are that now you've come to Krishna consciousness, you have to be very serious and very careful and never go back to that life again. Because that life before you were a devotee was, was so terrible, so bad. So we should have that, we should have that appreciation of the disgust for our sinful life before becoming devotee. So sometimes Krishna reminds us of that, to make us more serious in our practice of Krishna consciousness. Can, can you understand that? So that's why I forget. Yes, yeah, yeah. Krishna, Krishna gives us knowledge to remind us. But he allows us to forget sometimes also. That's also, uh, let me show you, there's another, let me see, oh, here, this one, probably, probably because we're talking about forgetting, so Prabhupada said, he said, actually unless we forget completely, we cannot enjoy. Unless we forget completely, actually we cannot enjoy. Maharaj? Yes? Is he referring to our past lives over here in this sentence, unless we forget completely, actually we cannot enjoy? Or is he referring to the same life, Maharaj? The same life. The same life. We, when we forget, it, it's saying, actually, we can, it, there should be a, there should be a space here that between the two, you know. It, unless we forget completely, actually we cannot enjoy. Because we're trying to enjoy, right? We're trying to enjoy material world. And in order to enjoy the material... Uh, yes, Swami Pastor. Actually, no, no, no. Let me just complete this video. So, sorry. Uh, 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 GCSE Media is cancelled. No, no, no. GCSE Media was killed. Imagine if we were trying to make a video. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna. <laughs> the living entity wants, we want to enjoy, but if we remember the past, then it's, it's more difficult for us to enjoy. <laughs> so when we forget, just like Prabhupada says in the drama, is everyone there? Can hear me? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So sometimes you do a drama 
So in the drama, you know, you may be playing alongside your friend, but in the drama, your friend is the enemy. It's a very different relationship. But if you're always thinking he's your friend, then you won't perform the drama very well. But when you forget the relationship, then you can act very nicely. So it's very important in performing the drama that you have to forget your actual identity of the stage. <coughs> so in the, same, in the same way we come to this material world and we're trying to enjoy this material world. And in order to enjoy it, we have to forget. <laughs> we have to forget that we're not the body, that we're that we're so, we have to forget these things, because if we remember that I'm not the body, I'm a soul, then we won't be able to enjoy the material world, because we'll know it's all illusion, it's not real. We're just wasting our time, we're just serving our senses. The soul is not getting any real pleasure. So, if we forget that knowledge, then <laughs> then we can try to enjoy. So it, it's like that. We want to do proper sadhana, we, we, have to un, we have to remember properly our spiritual nature and apply the philosophy. But if we forget, if we forget, oh, I, if we forget I'm a, I'm a soul, <laughs> If we, if, we, if we forget I'm not the body, then we'll try to enjoy the body. When, when we try to enjoy the body, we won't do sadhana. So it's important for us to understand how much important it is to understand that we cannot enjoy this material world. But if we are thinking we can enjoy, then we won't want to do sadhana. Actually, we cannot enjoy, you cannot find happiness in this material world, but there's the illusion of happiness. But sometimes we forget, sometimes we don't. So Krishna in the heart, he directs us according to our situation, according to our desire, because Krishna's in the heart, is the super soul, so he's right beside us. The soul and the super soul, they're right beside each other. So Krishna knows our desire and he facilitates. Sometimes he helps us forget and sometimes he tells us, helps us to remember. So it's like that very important point in this verse, right? So, Maharaj? Yes. So, uh, just to rephrase or conclude, are you saying that uh, he lets us forget that we are not this uh, soul and the super soul and we are this body just for enjoying, however, forgetting the past life, forgetting the events of our life as childhood and uh, um, growth is not what we are referring here of forgetfulness. We are referring to the fact that we are uh, we are not the soul and super soul, rather we are this body. Is that what you're referring? Yes, right. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Forget completely that we're not the body. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes? There's one more point um, where Krishna, in this verse, it says Krishna is Veda and Prakrit, the famous Vedyas and gave us the Sriman Bhagavata. So yeah. the Vedas, um, uh, although they present uh, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, the ultimate goal is to realize uh, the Lord and uh, this, uh, so Srila, um, so, but it's been covered. So Krishna came as Srila Vyasadeva and he gave us the Sriman Bhagavatam so that we understand what bhakti is, what our eternal relationship with him is. So we can understand the merciful nature of the Lord here. Although we, uh, we forget our um, uh, original position as a servant of the Lord, as part and parcels of the Lord, uh, he's come, he comes time and again to remind us of this, although he's seated in our heart and uh, reminding us, again and again he reminds us, you know, of, although he's given us his free will, he keeps reminding us of our position, but we are so foolish that we 
ignore his reminders. Yes, very good, right. Yeah, that's the super soul. Krishna is there with us, birth after birth, trying to remind us, trying to help us to come out of this material world. Right? Super soul is there trying to help us, to get us out, to take us back to Godhead. He's the Checha Guru, right? The Guru in the heart. So he's there to guide us and he guides us according to our desire. He knows also our desire. Do we need, are, have, we, have we still got the tendency to want to enjoy the material world more? So Krishna facilitates that. We, we, we're still trying to make, we, we're looking for some very big success and comfort and luxuries. To, we want position and fame in this material world. So we're not ready to go back to Krishna. So the super soul, you know, he has to stand by and just wait till we're ready to come to Krishna. So he allows us to forget what our real duty is, so that we can work harder, with, that we can enjoy more or try to enjoy more the material world. And then when we're ready, then Krishna, the super soul will act and he will arrange for us to meet the spiritual teacher and get the association of devotees and Srimad Bhagavatam show us how to get out this world. Okay, going ahead. Uh, here's Srila Vyasadev. So Krishna had said in 15 that he's the author, he's the compiler of the Vedas. So text 16 goes on to describe the Lord in his incarnation as Vyasadeva compiled the Vedanta Sutra. Here the Lord is giving in summary the contents of the Vedanta Sutra. Right? The Vedanta, Vedanta means the end of knowledge and Sutra means condensed. The end of knowledge means to know who? Not Krishna. 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 Yes, thank you. No, yeah. yeah, right. So the, 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 the contents of the Vedanta Sutra is... is to know to know that Krishna is the supreme. That's the knowledge, end of knowledge, no? Yes. To know that Krishna is the supreme, the end of knowledge, yeah. Vedanta Sutra. The Veda, Veda is the knowledge, Anta is the end, the end of knowledge, sutra condensed, very condensed. So not everybody can understand, but we know Vedanta Sutra, the end of knowledge is to know Krishna. So here the same knowledge is given in the Bhagavad Gita, in these few verses here, beginning text 16, describing the first section of this, this knowledge. Uh, what's called this uh, text 16, 17 and 18, they're called the Tree Sloki Gita. The essence of the Vedas in three verses. Vedic knowledge, you know, so many books and knowledge, so much in the Veda, and it's summarized in the Bhagavad Gita in three verses. The Tree Sloki Gita. First of all, text 16 describes two classes of beings, the fallible and the infallible. In the material world, every living entity is fallible, and in the spiritual world, every living entity is called infallible. So fallible means what? Fallible means make mistakes. In other words, conditioned, right? We're conditioned souls. But in the spiritual world, the living entities are infallible. They're the liberated souls, the perfect beings. And there's many more beings in the spiritual world than what's here in the material world. We're in the minority here in the material world. So the, the two classes of beings, the living entity, then text 17 goes on to describe, beside these two, there is the greatest living personality the Supreme Soul, the imperishable Lord Himself, who has entered the three worlds and is maintaining them. So, in addition to the living entities, 
there is the Supreme Lord also. He is the greatest living personality. And he has entered the three worlds. We heard how he's maintaining them, right? Holding the planets in position and the heat and the light, the fire and digestion, all of these different things he's maintaining. He's giving us also knowledge in the form of the Vedas. So this is all Krishna's work as a maintainer. And so then text 18 describes, Because I am transcendental, beyond both the fallible and the infallible, and because I am the greatest, I am celebrated both in the world and in the Vedas as that supreme person. So Lord Krishna is describing his own position. He is above both the fallible and the infallible. He is celebrated in this world and in the Vedas as the supreme person. Eckhart, we say there is one supreme controller, all others are his servants. Now, some of the servants are perfect beings and some of the perf servants are not perfect, they are conditioned souls. Conditioned souls are here in the material world and the perfect beings, they are there with him in the spiritual world. So in this way, the Vedanta is summarized, explaining the position of the Lord and the living entities. Right? They're just repeating what I read, these verses. Two classes of being, the fallible and the infallible. Everyone is fallible in this world. Spiritual world, everyone is infallible. No, they're all perfect beings. And above them, above the, the, these two kinds of living entities, there's the Supreme Lord, who is imperishable. He enters the three worlds, and he's maintaining them. At the same time, he's beyond them. So this is Krishna's uh, summary of the Vedanta knowledge. And we, the, we can also say that these three verses represent what is called Sambandha Gyan. Sambandha Gyan meaning knowledge of the relationship between the Lord and the living entities in the material world. This is the Sambandha Gyan. All of the Vedic scriptures, including Bhagavad Gita and all of the different slokas, they can be categorized into three different sections of knowledge called Sambandha, Abhidaya and Prayojana. Sambandha meaning the relationship. So this is our relationship, right? Krishna is describing, he's above us. He, we are fallible and there's others infallible, but he's above all of them. He is the controller, he's the supreme, he's the greatest. So that's Sambandha, this is the knowledge of Sambandha. Now the next verse, fifth, uh, the 19th verse of this 15th chapter will describe Abhidaya. Abhidaya means the process, Abhidaya Gyan, how to perform, how to apply this knowledge. You see this is actually the Purushottam Yoga, right? The, the Yoga of the Supreme Person. We should know how to apply this knowledge to worship the Supreme Person. So 15.19 says, Whoever knows me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, without doubting, is the knower of everything. This is how we have to apply this knowledge. If we, we have to know Krishna without doubting, and then we will know everything. So we have, to, we have to properly understand who is Krishna. We want to know Krishna, know Krishna as the Supreme Personality of God. We have to understand how is it that He is the Supreme Personality? How is it He is Bhagavan? What is, what is His qualification? That has to be understood. We have to understand it in, in 
with, without any doubt. There is Abhidaya. And then Abhidaya, there's one more section called Abhidaya Prayojana. Prayojana, I mean the goal of this, just this is the process of devotional service, but what is the goal of devotional service? And, oh, oh this is the quote from the 19th, let's read this first. One should submissively hear from Bhagavad Gita that these living entities are always subordinate to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anyone who is able to understand this, according to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, knows the purpose of the Vedas. All right? So, that is, uh, that is Krishna's statement, or Prabhupada's statement. Prabhupada is telling us like this from the purport. So the, you can see the process of devotional service based on submissively hearing the Bhagavad Gita, understanding this knowledge, accepting it, applying it, and then we will come to know Krishna, but just simply by hearing about Krishna. And we can hear about Krishna himself is speaking Bhagavad Gita. We're hearing di directly from him speaking, telling us about himself. We want to know about Krishna, he's describing himself for us. And so it's very important for us to understand. We want to know Krishna, let Krishna tell us himself. He therefore engages himself in my full devotional service, O son of Bharata. He therefore engages himself. So this is taken from also from this 19th verse. Bhajitimam sarva bhavena bharata. Sarva bhavena bharata. 19th verse. So this is still de describing prayojana. He therefore engages himself in full devotional service. This is the abhidaya, the process by which we can know Krishna. So how to know Krishna? Simply do devotional service and we will know Krishna, we will certainly know Krishna. And uh, the final verse is also describing Krishna. In this chapter, the first five verses, remember we were reading about the banyan tree? Describe the process of freeing oneself from these weaknesses of heart. And the rest of the chapter, from the sixth verse through the end, discuss Purushottam Yoga. Oh. We'll read the last verse, text number 20. This is the most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures, O sinless one. And it is disclosed now by me. Whoever understands this will become wise and his endeavors will know perfection. Okay, so uh, let's just see what were the objectives. We presented the overview, chapter 15. We have read, we heard also about the banyan tree with the references of the Bhagavad Gita. The meaning of Purushottam Yoga with reference to Bhagavad Gita 16 to 20, right? Purushottam Yoga, the yoga of the Supreme Person. So verses 16, 17, 18 describe the relationship with the Supreme Person. Text 19 describes the process and the goal also in 20. So this is Purushottam Yoga. Then we spoke also about uh, the relevance of, well we did that 
yesterday that verse was done, but we did 15.7 and 15.15 in preaching Krishna Consciousness. And a quote from Prabhupada, As long as a living entity is in this dark material world, he is in conditional light. But as soon as he reaches the spiritual sky, by cutting through the false, perverted tree of this material world, he becomes liberated. Then there is no chance of his coming back here. In his conditional life, a living entity considers himself to be the Lord of this material world. But in his liberated state, he enters into the spiritual kingdom and becomes an associate of the Supreme Lord. There he enjoys eternal bliss, eternal life and full knowledge. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, some more questions here? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, the Vedanta Sutra, uh, they are also taught in the, um, by the impersonalist. So what is their goal? The impersonalist, yes, they study the Vedanta, but they study the Vedanta based on the commentary of Shankaracharya. And Shankaracharya is telling, is preaching about the Mayavadi philosophy. The Mayavadi philosophy says, material world is all false and only the Brahman is truth. And they, they understand the Vedanta by their own mental speculation. They just simply try to understand the Vedanta through their own speculation by the power of their mind. They don't hear the explanation of the Vedanta from the Acharyas, the Vaishnava Acharyas. So big difference. The, 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 the Mayavad, the followers of Shankaracharya, they don't, they don't usually study Srimad Bhagavatam because Srimad Bhagavatam, actually Srimad Bhagavatam is Srila Vyasadeva's own commentary on the Vedanta. Srila Vyasadeva wrote Vedanta and he also wrote Srimad Bhagavatam and there's a relationship that the Srimad Bhagavatam is his commentary on Vedanta. But the Mayavadi is a fault. They don't read the Srimad Bhagavatam. They just try to understand the Vedanta on its own. So they, you know, when Lord Chaitanya was in Benares, the Mayavadis challenged Lord Chaitanya that why are you not studying Vedanta? But when, when they talked together, then Lord Chaitanya explained Vedanta to them. That Lord Chaitanya knew the, the Vedanta better than them. And similarly, when Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya was trying to teach Vedanta to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya had listened to Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya for seven days, but actually it was Lord Chaitanya who explained the Vedanta to Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya. He told Sarvabhuma, Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya that your explanations of the Vedanta are all puzzling. Nobody will ever understand them, what you are explaining. And Lord Chaitanya went on to explain the real meaning of Vedanta. And the result was all these people, they became devotees by Lord Chaitanya's preaching. When they heard the Vedanta from Lord Chaitanya, then they also agreed, this is right. And they all became devotees. So, Vedanta is... Uh, you know, we as devotees, we also study Vedanta through the Srimad Bhagavatam, because the Srimad Bhagavatam is commentary on Vedanta. Thank you, Maharaj. We want to. The goal. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, you uh, referred the Samanda is 15.18, uh, Shloka number 15.8, on 8. Yeah. And Avidya 15.19. Yeah. And Prajna, goal is which Shloka? Which one? 
Gol. Gol is uh, referring to which Shiloka Maharaj? Yeah. Well, it's it's there in 19 also because he says, uh, engages himself in my few, in my full devotional service. Oh, well, in text 20 said, whoever understands this will become wise and his endeavours will know perfection. So, like that, we can understand. Both in 19 and 20, it's indicating the goal. He therefore engages himself in full devotional service to me. So that can also be taken as a, you know, prayojana. Sarva bhavina bharata sasarva vid bhajate mam. He worships me, engages in full devotional service to me. So 19 can also be, uh, it can be Abhideya and the first part can be the Abhideya and second part can be the Prayojana. Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Prabhupada indicates like that when we read Prabhupada's purports, he talks about the, the knowledge, you know, he indicates the, the three levels of knowledge. Uh, it's Yeah, generally, the last verse is considered the prayojana. The goal. Okay, any other questions here? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, I have one question about the banyan tree. Yes. Uh, when, Krishna, when Krishna speaks about the material world being a reflection of the spiritual world, so the different parts of the tree like the branches or the fruits, does that represent something uh, in the spiritual world because it's a reflection? Or is it just to explain the characteristics of the material world? Yes, it's to explain the characteristics of the material world, right. We want to understand how this material world is the illusion. But we should also understand that there is a real tree. The, the real tree is in the spiritual world. Now, of course, in the spiritual world, you may, are you, you may wonder, well, is, is there fruit there, in the, is there, is there a tree in the, material, in the spiritual world? Yeah, there's a tree of devotional service, all right? We talk about the bhakti briksha, the tree, the tree of devotion, so that that's a real tree. And, and there's a creeper which grows, and that the tree should grow, it should take shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. And the fruit, the fruit will be love of God. Right? Harikis? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah? So these things are there in the spiritual world. Yeah. Nice point. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes? 
Yeah, we, we need to understand this tree. It's important point. Krishna giving this example. Remember, how is the tree nourished? Remember? Any, anyone remember? How is the tree nourished? Devotional service. Yes, in the spiritual world it's nourished by devotional service. But in the material world, how is it nourished? By the modes of nature, yeah, somebody said, the modes of nature, right, that's, you know, we're talking about the, the, the illusory tree. So, you know, we don't find any reference, Prabhupada doesn't speak here about the tree in the spiritual world, but certainly we can understand there is a tree in the spiritual world, which will be nourished by devotional service, but the tree here, in this world, this is being nourished by the three modes of nature. Yeah. And it's situated on, the tree is situated on, Desire. Right, on the desire, right. Desire. Yeah, according to the desire. You know, we all have our desire. Puts us here. Uh, just, just another clarification, uh, Maharaj Ji. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, tree, you said uh, the branches represent animals. Could you just say no, those di things di again? Different levels. Which represents di the different, demigods. Different levels of branches on the tree. Upper branches, upper situated on the upper parts of the tree are the demigods, right? And on the lower, on the bottom part of the tree, in the, in the you know, down there in the bottom of the tree, in the very dark region, this is the lower living entities like animals and, you know, plants, these kind of creatures, the lower species of life. Okay, and this is... This is the tree of the material world. Yes, right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Harikrishna uh, Maharaj, so the middle portion is uh, uh, the human being? Yes, right. Right. Thank you. Krishna Maharaj. Uh huh. Uh, Harikrishna. Hare Krishna. Yes, uh, Maharaj, is it that uh, whatever we want to be, uh, we are going to get that uh, attire on the next Janma? Like, uh, we want to be tall, uh, so in the next Janma, we, are go we will be tree? Is it like that? You explained uh, before. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe you'd be a giraffe, you know? <laughs> You could, you could become a giraffe. It depends also, you know, it's not just only desire, but also activity, karma. You know, we may desire to be qu queen, we may, we may become a queen bee, rather than the queen of a country. You may be the queen of, a queen in a bee colony. So, <laughs> somebody desires to be tall, yeah, trees are, can also be very tall. Other creatures are also tall. Relative things. Some, you know, people play basketball. They're often very tall. They get to very big people. So it depends a lot on desire and qualification. According to our how, we, how we've been working with the material nature, what kind of body we get, puts us in. And uh, you know, that, should, that consciousness should be there at the time of death, because at the time of death we carry that consciousness to the next body. Is that a punishment from uh, Lord Krishna that we are desiring to be something else? We are not satisfied with what he have uh, given us? Well, you can't say it's Krishna's punishment. It's our doing. We did it. We desired it. Krishna didn't do it. Nobody cursed us. Nobody, you know, Krishna doesn't interfere. He gives us that free will. It's, 
you know, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, he says, I'm not responsible for the sinful activities of people. He says, Every, you know, everyone, we all have to be responsible for our own activities, our own desires. And we're the, we're the, you know, we have to take the blame. We're, we're the doer. Ultimately, it's our doing, which, you know, we had the desire, we wanted to do this, we wanted that kind of act, body. And so we got it. Krishna facilitates it through the material nature, according to our qualification and desire. We get the results of our activities. Nobody forces us. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Dhanavad Pranam. So we're in the tree. How do we get out of the tree? What's the process to get freed from the tree? By using of detachment, Maharaj. Right. <coughs> mm. And how do we get that detachment? Attaching ourselves to the devotional service right. to Krishna. Right, yes. We have to cut down the tree, right, by devotion to Krishna. We get that detachment. So cultivating that detachment is done simply by becoming more attached to Krishna. The more we're attached to Krishna. So, therefore Krishna was telling us about the spiritual world. Here in this chapter, he was telling us how it is there. No need of a sun and moon. He, he wants us to come back. He wants us to go back there. But we're loitering here. We're thinking, well, I'll come soon. Just wait. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, by describing the spiritual tree, you were telling something like uh, the fruits of uh, the spiritual tree, something you described, Maharaj. Can you just uh, repeat that one? Uh, the fruit of the tree? Well, yeah. The fruit of the tree in the material world will be the Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Right? That's the results of our actions here in this material. In spiritual world, Maharaj, you said that the real tree is there in spiritual world. Yeah, the tree of devotion is there. And so the, the fruit of that tree is love of God. Okay, okay. Yeah, love of God, Krishna Prem. Hmm? Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, we want to cultivate that, yeah. I'll just read a little bit to you from the last paragraph of the final verse here in chapter 15. Srila Prabhupada writes, While one is performing devotional service in the association of pure devotees in full Krishna consciousness, there are certain things which require to be vanquished altogether. The most important thing one has to surmount is weakness of the heart. The weakness of the heart. The first fall down is caused by the desire to lord it over material nature. Thus one gives up the transcendental loving service of the Supreme Lord. The second weakness of the heart is that as one increases the propensity to lord it over material nature, he becomes attached to matter and the possession of matter. The problems of material existence are due to these weaknesses of the heart. In this chapter, the first five verses describe the process of freeing oneself from these weaknesses of heart. And the rest of the chapter, from the sixth verse through the end, discuss Purushottam Yoga. 
right? So the weakness of the heart. Right? We quoted that verse, verse number uh, five. Nirmana moha jita sangha dosha. Right? What's the problem? What's the difficulty? What do we need to do before we can surrender to Krishna? We have to get free from? What thing? Material desires? False prestige. Yes, that pride, right? It's pride, the false prestige. This is the, the illusion, this thing which is holding us here in this material world. We're so attached, we're so proud of the, our tiny little kingdom here in this world. We have our little apartment and we have our little home and we have our little empire and we're very attached. So that pride in the material existence, pride in thinking, this is mine, I worked hard for this. This is all the illusion. So we have to be very careful of these things. This is the weakness of the heart which stops us from fully taking up this process of bhakti yoga. Okay? Are there any other questions? Okay. Good. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Uh, how can we experience love of God? How can you experience love of God? Well, one pr way in which you can experience is that you have to go through the process. First of all, you acquire the Sambandha Gyan, and then from Sambandha Gyan, you apply that knowledge in devotional service, the Abhidaya. And by the Abhidaya, by doing the Abhid, following the Abhidaya, the process of devotional service, then the love of God will come about. You can experience it. It will take some time. Just like when you grow a tree, it takes some time for the tree to grow. And it will take some time before the fruit comes on the tree. And then you have to wait for the fruit to ripen. So like that, you know, you have to be a little patient you want to experience love of God. So you go through the process. You, you don't just immediately, you can't just go there and you, you, want to, you want to buy love of God? You know what the price is? There's, the price is you, you, you have to want it so badly that you will cry to get it. When you can shed tears because you want love of God so badly. That is the price. You have to want it very badly, very intensely. Then you can get it. But that's the only price. There's no other, they won't give you any discount. You cannot bargain. It's not like going in the market and you say, Oh, come, sa come, kidna rupiya chai. Yeah, you know, you want to get cheaper price. No, you have to pay, there's only one price and that is that intense eagerness to get it. So eager that you will even shed tears to get it. So, are you ready? Are you qualified? Need your blessing, Maharaj. Yeah, we all need blessings, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a cheap thing, you know. We don't get it, we don't get honor, honorary degrees. Did any of you get honorary degree from the university? Did you? No, not usually. Very rare to get honorary degree. And same way, we want to get love of God. You have to do, you have to do, it. you have to do sadhana bhakti. You have to go through the process. Cultivate the sambandha gyan. Then do the abhidaya. Then you will come to the prayojana. Hmm? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so tomorrow night we're going to go on, uh, the, uh, on, the, on Tuesday. Oh, uh, no, today's Tuesday, right? On Thursday. 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 Yeah, Thursday we're going to go on to chapter 16. And we'll hear about the divine and demoniac nature. A very interesting chapter. Okay, so thank you very much. We will stop here then tonight. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. His Holiness. Srila Prabhupada Ki! Thank you so much Maharaj for your patience and compassion that you are answering our questions nicely. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.